everyone um, for joining us. I really appreciate you coming back. And uh, I know you've had a, a long day. And uh, so marketing your beef locally, series two, marketing and cooking underutilized cuts and moving forward, if I can move forward here. Um, we know beef and you guys know that and that's why you're here and we're going to hopefully give you some more insights on what we know about beef. Um, just a, a slight kind of a insight on myself. Uh, I've been with the Beef Council for 15 years. However, I spent 20 years in food service. So uh, what I kind of know about the cookery aspect of it um, and combined with my knowledge of the beef industry and the cuts, believe me, my cooking prowess with beef has improved over the years, uh, most definitely because once upon a time beef came out of the box for me and uh, and that's where my beef came from and obviously I know better than that by now. So tonight's agenda, we're gonna talk a little bit about the consumer because that's really, really important. Um, and then we're gonna talk about taste, flavor and tenderness because that's what is part of the winning items to beef and the product that you have. And then we're gonna dive into those cuts and cookery and then some maybe some uh, consumer marketing options. And it's not for us to tell you what to do or how to do it. It's you guys kind of deciding how you want to do it yourself based on a lot of different variables. So we're going to start with the consumer. And that consumer has definitely changed. Um, the, there's that retail piece of it. There's the local that has awakened as of COVID-19. And uh, people all of a sudden realize that beef isn't just coming out of your grocery store. And we always focus on that millennial. Uh, millennials with children, that older millennial, they've got the purchase power right now. They're the largest population segment that we have, and this is where a lot of our focus is. And these are the folks that are coming to that farmer's market. They are checking out, they are curious, and they want to know what's going on. They want to know how that product is being made. So the consumer has also increased interest in cooking trying new foods and seeking out new recipes. It's, it's been there, but I think even more so now since COVID uh, because all of a sudden they were forced to cook more. They probably got bored with the same old thing and said, you know what, I want to try something different. And now they're seeking out some new innovative ways. And it's that generation that is willing to say, I want to try Thai or I want to try Italian or I want to try this. And they're willing to go and step outside the box. All they need is a quick video and voila, they're, they're gonna cook it themselves. Um, the preferred cooking method likes they steak and beef burgers grilled outdoors. Um, they're a little afraid of roast because it's a big chunk of meat and they're not really sure what to do with it. So we'll help a little bit of that. Fajitas and stir fry, something that they can put in a tortilla that they can put with some rice and super easy and, uh, and family friendly. And then roast from the oven, they're probably not so much in the oven as much as they're going to go towards that slow cooker or that that um, that instant type cooking and the pressure cooker of sorts. So that's what they're they're looking for that fast, friendly, family, easy. And then as I just mentioned, the ethnic cuisine sauces and spices are more popular. A lot of them are looking online to see how they can do and be their own mixologist. And some of them it comes in the bottle already, and they don't have to worry about it. Um, that they're interested and they're able and they're they're wanting to explore those ethnic cuisines they're not afraid to experiment they're not afraid to to try different things some of us are like yeah too spicy my heartburn i'm not going to taste it that's too funky for me no nope. we've got a whole generation who's willing to try and do anything and then the more exotic it is more interesting the more they can brag about it on social media take a picture of the dish that they ordered at a restaurant or made at home and said look Look at what I have or what look what I'm eating and brag about it. And then of course, as I mentioned, the largest largest consumer segment that we have is that millennial group. You know, they they associate their favorite ethnic cuisine, Spanish, South American, things that we never even thought of or even know that exist when it comes to a flavor profile. And all all it is maybe one little spice like curry or adobo or what have you out there that makes people more intrigued. I'm just going to let a couple of people in here. All right. Oops, and I got to go back to this. There we go. 
So now we have to look at meeting that consumer demand. And in a world full of health conscious and information information seeking consumers who are on a budget. Let's face it, we're all on a budget. We have 19.6 million strong in the state of New York. That Northeast is jam packed with human beings that are looking for something to eat. They want it to fit in their health conscious life and they want to make it in a hurry. 30 minutes or less, you know, a year, few years ago is to be, what can I cook four minutes in the microwave to put dinner on the table? And that's all anybody knew how to do was cook four minutes in the microwave. And I'm sure when COVID hit, that's all they knew what to do. So now they're thinking a little bit differently. And that consumer desirability is from the nutrition information, but it's not the driving force. They want to know what they're eating is nutrition. Um, that cut education. They want to know what to do with these cuts because all of a sudden I, they bought a bucket load of beef. It's in their freezer. Now they don't know what to do with it. Or they go to the farmer's market and you have some different interesting cuts that may not be in retail on a regular basis. Meal ideas. They're always looking for something new that they want to experiment. Otherwise, why would there be Pinterest and 50 million cookbooks out there? It, it is just the way of the world. Is, I want to do something new. I still, after all these years, want to try something different. The lifestyle that they have, it's grab and go, it's convenience, it's, you know what, maybe on the weekends I'll do something that um, will be a little bit more in depth and cook a little bit more. I know I cook a little bit uh, bigger meals on a Saturday or Sunday than I do during the week. Um, and then it's their identity. They get to brag about it. They get to social post about it. They get to have that opportunity to say, look what I just created. And like I said, COVID-19 changed everything and just made people more aware of cooking, made people more aware where their food comes, made people more aware of what they wanted to, to eat to satisfy their hunger. So what makes a, a great beef eating experience? Well, it could be the type of cuisine. It could be that best fancy restaurant. It could be the animal and what it eats and how it's finished off. It could be how it's cooked, you know, Lord knows anybody's taking a steak and making it well done. Don't even bother. It's going to be a completely different eating experience than something that's medium rare. It could be the cut. Let's face it. An eye round steak is going to be completely different than a ribeye. And then, of course, the grating, the marbling aspect of it. We all know a little bit more fat in that middle is going to be a mighty tasty, mighty tender meal. So that grating aspect is important as well. But the number one driving force, the reason consumers purchase beef is because we rule in taste. Hands down, beef rules when it comes to the taste parameter. So we need to savor that flavor of beef in a variety of ways, whether it's a steak, whether it's a burger, whether it's a stir fry, we need to really capitalize on that. And we have that versatility in our beef cuts to be able to cover the gauntlet of it. So whoop, we already know taste is great. So palatability is the overall eating sensation of beef when it's eaten. And those three factors that determine palatability are tenderness, flavor, and juiciness. So that is what gives you that mmm and that mouth feel. And, and that's what kind of pushes people towards that taste profile. You know that. You're growing it. They're learning that or they figured that out and they just keep driving back to that. Also, a quick idea about um, insight on USDA grading, okay? That is that um, quality grade that is a, a constant. We talked last time that there is sometimes that disconnect in those quality aspects. We grade things on prime choice and select, but the consumer is looking at a lot of different other things. They're looking at grass finish, they're looking at organic, they're looking at range free, et cetera. But what we, um, what some of you may know or may not know is that as you see that inspector there, he cut between the 12th and the 13th rib, and he is grading that whole entire car carcass based on that back fat, the internal fat, that cartilage, how old does that animal look, the size of that ribeye, the marbling of it, and that is going to create that fine choice or select. And that is the scoring for all in food service and retail in which to grade and push towards the consumer. It's that consistency. And let me tell you, these guys are, are dead on. Um, now they have cameras doing it, but they found that these inspectors were probably just as effective as those cameras. So tenderness, 
we all know we love tender a filet mm, melts in your mouth those ribeye the uh, the top round mm, you're gonna have to chew it if you don't marinate it so some of those factors influencing beef tenderness is obviously the type of cut as i mentioned tender loins number one that eye round oh it's gonna be down there for a little bit the marbling level higher the quality grade definitely the better that the tenderness piece of it is. Age and maturity. We know that sweet spot, 18 to 24 months to send that animal to harvest. And uh, the older the animal gets, it's gonna be a little bit tougher. The quality grade's gonna come down a little bit because that age factor. Genetics, okay? We can have an argument all day long, what genetic variable is better? And y'all decide that, I'm not gonna tell you, but hey, you know, and you can get into like the breeds and stuff. That's a whole nother argument as well. I don't want to argue those things. You guys can do that amongst yourselves, like at the water cooler. Post-mortem aging, wet, dry, wet aging or dry aging. There is that difference. And then for different cuts and for specific cuts, you would dry age versus wet age. And we'll talk about that. Rate of chilling. A fast chill is, is going to be more impactful than a slow process chill because less ice crystals. Um, and then that further processing, are you going to be further tenderizing those meats? Um, I know there was a big thing about, you know, needling the beef or, you know, like a chopstick. Um, those chopsticks are needled a little bit more for that tenderness or those cube steaks. And then the type of cookery and the degree of doneness. Medium rare is going to be way more juicy, way more tender than a well done. And the cookery of it, you know, that dry heat cooking or that moist heat co cooking is really important to understand. Oh, hold on a second, I'll let somebody in. All right. So flavor and juiciness, mm, yummy. Taking a look at that animal from chuck, the rib, the loin and the sirloin and the round, you can see where that flavor aspect is. The chuck and the rib, very rich beef flavor. And that one and that sirloin are that moderate and where that round is that mild beef flavor. There's not a lot of marbling in that round. I mean, that's a big muscle moving around a 1400 pound animal. So there's a lot, that's why it's a little tougher. These are just hanging out, keeping all of the internal organs in place. And that chuck has some amazing marbling. I just ground up a chuck roast today um, that we were using for something else and whew, there's going to be some tasty ground beef that we're going to be using. So looking at that flavor profile, that, that rich flavors in that chuck because of that marbling and um, that fat that's in there. And then you start getting into that moderate flavor, but you're getting into that tenderness in that middle area. And then that round is a little bit milder. Oops. All right. So knowing all of that, you've got a little insight in that consumer, what they're thinking, what they're feeling, um, and kind of looking at that carcass. We're going to get into the beef cuts and the cooking methods. And some of this stuff you're going to be seeing, like that you saw a little bit, it's going to be a good overview to kind of put last time um, communication together with this one. Again, looking at that beef carcass, looking at those end meat, that chuck in the round, 53% of the animal is at the end, where once upon a time, all y'all did was grind it. And so that muscle profiling study back in the year 2000, where they took 32 different muscles, broke them down, and, and we went through all those different new cuts last time. That ribbon, that loin, there's your money maker right there, but only 27% along with the bris brisket plate and flank, and you don't get a whole heck of a lot of those. So you gotta kind of capitalize on those ends and really kind of, um, those are those underutilized pieces that you really have to concentrate on to make your, your money. Now, we're gonna take a look at all these types of, of cooking techniques, grilling, braising, stewing, broiling, skillet. These are very um, amazing icons that Beef It's What's For Dinner has on their website. And I'll show you um, kind of an example of them as we go through. And this is kind of a, a nice little identifier to some of the recipes and to some of the cuts of what you can do with them. So you'll see that as we move forward. So each one accordingly. So we're gonna hit that chuck first. And like we showed you last time, here are a bunch of cuts from the chuck that you most likely would have in your freezer that you would freeze your beef or that you would have custom cut. And taking a look over here on the side, 
this is what you would do with these particular cuts. Pressure cooker, A1, definitely. Braise or slow cook, definitely. These are all kind of moist heat cooking and that stew. And let me see if I, more, okay. So that moist heat cooking for those that may not have a full understanding is that's when you're cooking and you're putting liquid with it and it's cooking for at a low heat for a long period of time, two, three, four, six, 12 hours, depending on if you're gonna be using a slow cooker, braising the oven for three to four hours, the pressure cooker, it's gonna cook a little faster or even that stewing piece. Now here we have some collateral that is downloadable. We can send to you as a three simple steps for braising, pot roasting or stewing. And a lot of it is just choose your cut. It's how do you prepare your beef? As you can see over here in the braising, the pot roasting side of it, you're putting liquid with it. It could be wine, it could be a vinegar mix, it could be oils. And that, that acidic piece of it when you're braising and pot roasting is what breaks down what breaks down um, the muscle fibers, it breaks down the collagen and, um, and makes that, th those cuts a little bit more tender and not so chewy. Uh, and then how to cook it. And a lot of times it's just taking a look and say, how long is that pressure cooker gonna be for? And you gotta read the recipe for it. So taking a look at those, this is the moist heat cooking. So when you are marketing the chuck roast in a certain time of year, in the fall and the winter, and even, even chuck roasts are going 20, 12, 12 months out of the year because pressure cookers never get put away. It used to be just in the winter time, and now people are doing it all the time. It's the go-to now. Stewing beef, again, it's a pick your cut, find your, your liquid and, and, uh, and what you're going to mix with it, and then cook away for a few hours, and then you're going to either put it on potatoes or you're going to be putting with pastas or rices or what have you. So that is kind of how to cook the chuck, the roast, those ribs, moist heat all the way. So, and then some innovative chuck recipes. Okay, you always got to think a little differently that it's not just going to be a chuck roast and with potatoes and carrots, that there are a variety of different things that you can do with that chuck now. Beef is what's for dinner has a shredded beef five ways. It's not just barbecue. It can be four other flavor profiles from Asian to Mexican to you name it, it's there. Beef, sweet potato hash, breakfast, right there. Super easy. In fact, this is one of the recipes that goes into school food service they were able to change. Um, fundido, it's an appetizer. Hey, the big game is coming up. This is what you want to tell people about. Put on your website um, or put in your Instagram. Hey, those that got a chuck roast this, uh, this year, this is what you do with your leftover pat roast. And this is actually a leftover recipe. Four ways to slow cook or shredded beef. Again, it's not just plain old shredded beef. You can put four different flavor profiles to it that are super amazing. Again, here we hit the breakfast and then, hey, look at this. We got nachos in a completely different way. It doesn't have to be a tortilla strip, uh, chip. It can be a waffle fry. So cool. So it's kind of what the Irish nachos, they call it. Now, before we said there's a lot roast and everything from the chuck that are moist heat. But remember when we talked about the muscle profiling and those diamonds in the rough, that's the flat iron, the Denver, the petite shoulder tender, and the ranch steak, those aren't moist heat cooked. They're good enough to be grilled, stir fried, skillet, or skillet to oven. And that is that dry heat. There's no moisture involved in it at all. You're not putting liquids. In fact, if you did put a liquid with it, those meats would become tough. How ironic. You want them to be on top and you throw liquid at them with the, the roast and everything from the chuck. But these steak cuts from the chuck, they can be grilled, dry heat cooked, pan fried, and skilled to oven where you go ahead and you sear them, and then you pop them in the oven to fish, finish them off to the proper cooking temperature that you want. Again, super easy. We've got these one, two, three, that when you're marketing these cuts, here it is, folks. This is what you have. And you can go ahead and put them on your website for them to download as well or send them to us. All right. So as I mentioned, beef is what's for dinner. If I were to go into the cuts and I ask for you know, the beef blade chuck roast, this is what they refer to us because everybody's got a different name for all of these cuts, unfortunately. 
then you can see here that cookie method. Here's that little cooking icon. It shows where it comes from. And then it gives you the nutrition breakdown. And every single recipe will have this and the cooking method. All of the cuts that are in Deep It's What's for Dinner will have this information as well. So that is your go-to resource. Let's hit the round, the other end of that carcass. And here are your round roast and steak. These can be skillet, broiled, roasted, slow cooked, braised, and grilled. Now, as you see here, I've got things that are sirloin, sirloin, sirloin. These are actually from the round, but a little closer to that sirloin piece of it. And these are some of the little bit more tender aspects of the round itself that a number of things can be done as far as um, what you see right here. So that is kind of giving that information and that insight. So the round steaks and roasts, this is again, your dry heat, moist heat um, type of thing. But with some of the stuff that was the round steaks, it can be a dry heat. If you're going to take a top round roast, you can dry heat that thing all the way. And it's gonna be a nice slow roast and you cut it really thin. Hey, your jelly roast beef that's in the market, that's where it's coming from, this cut right here. All right, you can do the same thing. Look at that medium rare, it's gonna be awesome. And then you can take that top round steak right there and marinate it. 12 to 24 hours, you can take those cuts from the round, all right, top round here, even the eye round, all of these right here. And you can throw some oil and some soy on it or wine or something acidic, dressings that are acidic based, Italian dressings, et cetera. And you got yourself an awesome stir fry. You have some awesome grilling and that makes it nice and tender. What I suggest you make sure you do is you pat it dry before you grill it because it will cause a steaming effect. And again, make your meat tough. So you can actually do some moist heat and some dry heat with those rounds and those rolls. Some innovative recipes again are some of the um, fried beef steaks with spicy blue cheese sauce. You can take them, pound them out and create almost like a um, country fried chicken type thing. Kebab, another thing to do with that top round is that you go and marinate this, you put them on the, on the grill kebab and it's gonna be a great eating experience. Plus these recipes right here in the bottom are all from Beef It's What's For Dinner and they've got that nice little cooking time here telling you what to do. Look at, you've got different types of round sticks for the top round. Stuff from uh, with vegetables, beef steaks, you name it, it's right there. Driving your customers to be fit what's for dinner for all these innovative ideas. Now, kind of like the newly discovered, not so much for us. We know there was always a brisket, a plank, and a plate, but our consumers never did. And thanks to the Food Network, ta-da, they discovered them um, and realized, oh my goodness, we can do some really cool things with it because these celebrity chefs are making it look really fine. There's the brisket flat and the point. This is gonna become a really popular cut in about a month, St. Patrick's Day is coming up. This is the number one cut in Texas because what do they do with the brisket in Texas? They smoke it. That's what they do with it. What do we do with it in the Northeast? We corn it and make corned beef and cabbage. Uh, the flank steak, super popular in the, the uh, Southwest. What do they do with it? They're grilling it and they're making fajitas out of it, along with the tri tip. Short ribs are becoming super popular because of the Food Network. And so are these cuts right here, the hangers, outside, inside, all very popular because of the Food Network. And what are people doing when they're not doing social media? They're watching the Food Network to see what something new and tasty that they can create. Now, the brisket, flank and plate, look at all of these methods of cooking. Yes, they can all be smoked. Remember, the brisket can be pressure cooker, indirect grilling. If you don't have a smoker, you can indirect grill that brisket and have a great smoked barbecue. The same with the flame. Uh, the roasting, grilling, broiling, stir frying. Again, you can cut up that flank or the, uh, those uh, skirts and everything, and you got some great fajitas. That's what the skirt is used for sometimes. They marinate it, and then they go ahead and make fajitas out of it. And you can see all of these three simple steps right here. Indirect grilling, 
because I did not know for a very long time how to indirect grill. Now I get it. Can you do it with the gas? Sure you can. If you got a three burner gas uh, uh, grill, you turn off one or two of them and then you, you uh, put the meat where the, the burner is off and it's just a nice slow roast. So it's all right here. Innovative recipes utilizing all of those cuts is again, like I mentioned, fajitas, a marinated flank steak that you can cut up and can be part of like a, a fajita, tostada, skewered meat where you can marinate it and then you grill it. And it's uh, again, you put it in a pita. Um, what's a good example of that? Uh, speedy in the, in the southern tier, speeders are, are super hot. Corned beef hash. Again, you can braise that brisket. You can braise brisket street style tacos. Who knew a brisket could be a taco? Uh, maybe Texas, maybe not the Northeast. And then chili. You can go ahead, cut it up, and then you can go and uh, nicely slow roast it and make an awesome chili. And there's some really good chili recipes on Beef is What's for Dinner using more than just ground beef. And now we get to the money makers that you all love sirloin, rib, and the loin. <clears throat> This is roasting, grilling, broiling, stir frying, skillet, all dry you. You're not putting any liquid on these guys at all. And if you do decide that uh, you want to encourage somebody to marinate, a couple hours, top. 30 minutes, best. Um, if you want a different kind of flavor, but I suggest like a, a dry rub. Cut from the loin, good old porterhouse, the T-bone, these rolls. Right here, the strip fillets that we talked about, the New York strip, my personal favorite, the rib, there you go, breaking that rib down so that you have even more fun with it um, and, and get more bang for your buck other than just a good old roast. And it's all a dry heat, folks, just like Arizona. You can put a dry rub on it or that minimal marination when you're selling that cut of meat saying, hey, you're gonna marinate it because you want that flavor. 30 minutes, an hour maybe, but never more than two hours. Sous vide, those of you who are not familiar with sous vide cookery is kind of like a partial cooking and it's um, either frozen in a cryovac and it's a slow bringing to a, a temperature using boiling water. Um, it's often done in um, food service in like, for instance, when I worked in the nursing home system, we had 525 residents there. We would use that sous vide cooking because everything could be brought up to temperature at a specific time or in uh, all simultaneously. So it was easier to serve people. A lot of good information about sous vide cooking on Beef is What's for Dinner. But here again, all of these infographics of one, two, three, on how to roast, grill, boil. And that's one of the things the millennials are, are slowly learning is how to do this. So if you have these available, you can drive them to where it is, whether it's on our website, or you put it on your website, or you have that collateral available on hard copy, it's the way to go for them. And middle meat recipes, more than just the steak, folks, those middle meat recipes can be an ingredient as well, whether it be in a kebab or a pizza, an appetizer, putting it with pastas or that salad. A lot of times those steaks, you can get pretty big and people can't finish it all in one sitting. So, hey, this is the next day meal, mixing it in with it. I do it all the time. Sometimes I'll, I'll cook up extra steaks and then I purposely create that next meal with the leftovers. And that's something you can encourage your customers to do. So, some customer marketing or consumer marketing options. First of all, it's all by the season. You're not gonna sell those metal steaks. Well, maybe you are, but you're really probably not gonna push them that much when it's winter time, because nobody's grilling. People might get them for maybe the holidays, but it's when that summer and that spring hits that these, these probably fly right out of your freezer. Kind of taking a look at, you know, maybe burgers at a certain time of year, maybe a roast at a certain time of year. So looking at beef bundles by season, maybe, you know, and seeing what those bundles look like. Maybe it's a combination of some burgers and some steaks and some rolls. Kind of putting all those things together. If you got some rogue cut that you don't know what to do with, toss it in with a recipe and say, hey, try this. It's kind of something new and innovative. Um, or taking a steak and some stew meat and ground beef and putting it all together 
and kind of giving some recipe ideas there as well. I know that um, some of the producers that we work with, they've created some recipe cards and um, they put it with a certain cut that is not familiar to their consumer. Bundle by cooking method. So if these are braising cuts, you've got the, a little bit of a brisket there, you've got a chuck roast and you've got some ribs. Maybe that's the bundle pack that you put together. That grilling piece of it where you've got some of the steaks, you've got a ribeye, a strip steak, and you know the I believe that's the flank right there. Broiling. Sometimes you're going to broil that porterhouse and burgers and some of your petite steaks. And then, of course, that, that winter roasting piece of it or that holiday roasting piece of it. So it is kind of thinking differently as to do you want to do it by season? You can do it by cooking method or you can incentivize people that, you know, want to try something different and new, but they, they're not sure. So it could be, hey, you buy this. Maybe you get a pound of stew meat for free, or maybe you get a pound of ground beef for free, or at a reduced cost. I'm not saying give away the cow. I'm just saying think a little bit differently that people are always um, looking for. So Kevin asked real quick about organ meats. You know what? You know your customer base. If people are looking for tripe and liver and all of tongue, uh, there is a market for it. It may not go as fast, but then again, there's only one liver and there's only one tongue and there's so you can create steaks out of that um some people like kidney not really sure uh, but organ meats you can put it out there and find out if people like it or not or and if you got the inventory after a farmer's market because you can't sell it then you know oops it's not going to go another really cool thing that um some do are the bones uh for soups uh for their dogs uh, so they're selling their, the bones or, you know, hey, if you got a dog, I'll give you a, a, a couple pounds of, of bones that have been roasted off or, or whatever. So it's kind of thinking differently of how to, to capitalize on some of that, that extra stuff that might just get rendered somehow. And then, hey, there's that inventory clean out sale and incentives. Like, hey, you got a lot of eye round steak and you don't know what to do with. Or you got stew meat and you don't you know what to do with. Or you got a pallet of Western grillers. Or you got a pallet of pumps and you're like, oh my God, it never, ever left. You can do a one day sale. You can do a $5 off. You can do 15% off. You can do a friends and, friends and family discount. You can do a punch card incentive to get people to come back. And that every time that they, they buy, I don't know, $5 worth of meat, then they get a punch. And then once they buy $50 worth of meat, then maybe they get, you know, 15% off or whatever. It's always that incentive that you're looking for. Hey, you buy buy for me 10 times and you know what? You get uh, a free ribeye steak or something. But it's kind of thinking differently. Get, you know, create a beef lover's coupon. I mean, I literally created this and, and made this happen. And it's so easy that you can do it with uh, some clip art and, print it out and voila, you've got it. So all of this stuff exists. It's fun. Think outside of the box, which you can do to attract your customer to, to you, whether it's to do an inventory cleanup or to maybe dangle a carrot in front of them to say, hey, check this out. I've got some cool um, consumer friendly things. Yeah, you're a great customer. So I want to give you something in return. Can you do this with um, those that are buying quarters and halves? Sure you can. You know, so it is working with your custom cutter to, to do that. So, Dean, there's a question in the chat box. What happens when you over marinate um, some of those more tender cuts like sirloin or um, cuts from the rib? What happens when you over marinate it? It'll break down the muscle where it becomes very mealy. Um, I love it when people say, oh my God, I marinated my London broil for like two days. And it melted in your mouth. And I'm like, yeah, why don't you put it in the blender? That would have been like a lot easier. It will make the, the meat very mushy and very mealy. And you don't want to do that. You want to at least have, you want it to melt in your mouth, but you at least want to have a good bite to it. Um, the other thing too is that marination only goes in so far, just like a little bit. Um, and you don't want marination to rule the flavor of beef. That's why I remember about 45s ago, it's the flavor of beef. You know, salt, plain old salt and pepper is what drives them. And we just go ahead and add extra flavors to break up the boredom of sorts. 
Uh, the question is, if you butcher cows by the halves, should you still get flank steaks, briskets, and plates? Again, that's your call and it's your market because looking at this slide right now, how you do what you do is based on your customer, based on your farm, and based on your goals. What do you want to achieve? You know, what, what, what is your end game? What is, what is, how do you want to make that connection that your farm can handle and benefit from and that your customer will come be that repeat person to come back um, over and over again? Um, so as far as that, those flank steaks, briskets and plates, sure, because maybe some folks are going to like that. And maybe that's what you, that's your incentive of if you get a quarter and a half and they, that's maybe not part of it, I'm going to throw a brisket in there um, for you to try. Um, or if you have a side where you're actually doing some freezer, maybe that's what you put out there as well. So how you kind of market that is based on kind of your your marketing plan of sorts of, of these three things and it's determined by that customer. It's determined about what your farm can handle, what it, they can do and what your goals are and what you wanna hit. So any questions, anything you want me to go back to? And what I can do is let me, um, Let's see here. Hold on a second. Let me get into beef with what's for dinner. Do you see this? Or is it still my PowerPoint? No, it's still your PowerPoint. You've got to stop sharing your screen and then reshare it on the new uh, page you want to be showing. All right. Uh... Okay, here it is. So now do you see it? Yep, looks good. Okay, so here beef is what's for dinner. What I would suggest if you're doing farmer's markets, what I would suggest um, is literally have an iPad or have a computer there and have it trained on this website. Um, we also have cards that, I, Chuck knows beef cards that drives people to the Chuck knows beef piece. It also drives to um, all of the Beef is What's for Dinner platforms and uh, all of that. So looking at recipes, recipes are in a variety of ways, whether it's broken down to chilies or heart healthy recipes, salads, 30 minutes or less, um, grilling favorites, um, not your average salad. It's, there's an abundance of different, you know, fiesta worthy Mexican meals, tailgating, it's hitting everything. So here's slow cooker. And as you see here, these are some of the slow cooker um, ideas. So one of the recipes I showed you was four way slow cooked shredded beef. So here it is, kind of gives you an idea, tells you what those ingredients are. Also powered by chicory. So I can click on to that. And those that don't actually go to the grocery store, it's an Instacart type opportunity right now. Here's the information on cooking. Here's some tips, how long it's gonna cook for, serving, calories per serving, protein. And look at it, there's Mexican shredded beef, barbecue, Asian, and Indian. Go figure. Here's the calories for that. And, uh, and some other information as far as like that chuck roast that you're using it. And then here's some other recipes you might like, and I'll keep showing you more be frequently asked questions and cooking lessons. So it's all encompassing here on beef is what's for dinner. When it comes to cooking um, and people are confused about it, oh, look at those icons. You can see where I stole those from. And all about ground beef or the corned beef or the prime rib or jerky, you know, slow cooking tips, marinades and rubs, when to use them pairing beef and alcohol, and I'm not just saying pour it in a glass, like how you can put alcohol in the recipe and then drink it on the side too, because there's always leftovers. Outdoor cooking, um, determining that doneness, so it's the optimum. And then safety handling. We do a really, really, really good job of safety on the farm, and then the consumer kind of blows it a little bit. Now, I mentioned Chuck knows beef. I'm sure you've heard us talk about it in the past. 
Chuck knows great things. And that is our kind of our virtual or AI. Uh, if you have that Alexa, that's, you can hook it up to that. You can get it right on your phone itself. And Chuck, yeah, yeah. yeah. My Alexa right here doesn't know that because she just said, hmm, I don't know that. Um, look, hi, I'm Chuck. Nose beef. Ask a question or try one of these beefy topics. And you can ask Chuck, say, hey, Chuck, what is the proper cooking temperature of medium rare? And Chuck will tell you or tell your, your consumer. And it's downloadable for you um, to enjoy. Um, Oh, okay, so Johnny Prime. Thanks, Johnny, for organ meats. My experience is that they fail, fall into either slow and low or fast and hot cooking methods. For example, tripe is a slow and low organ as it gets tender and delicious with time and moisture. And the other side, hard is super lean, so hot and fast on a flat surface with a little bit of olive oil and flake salt. The fact that you know that in the heart. Kudos to you, Johnny Prime. Um, I'll let you talk about that all day long. Um, but yeah, way to go. And um, let's see what else. Oh, and then again, the cuts. We talked about this last time and exploring the cuts. Again, it could be cuts by what you're needing for our stir fries or cuts you can marinate. And here they all are, kebabs and flames and outside. So there's giving you those, those tips. As I mentioned before, all you have to do is click on that this is what I showed you earlier. Here's the cut. Here's some other um, ideas that are known as a flank, flank steak, filet, jiffy steak, plank steak. Um, here are the cooking methods to that flank. Here's the average nutritional for it for an average three ounce serving of beef. And then here's a bucket load of recipes using this cut. And look at them, they're all different. Mushu beef, fajitas. Steak wrap. Remember when I said fajitas are it in the Southwest, and there's still more. Salad, Thai, Caribbean, garlic Thai mar marinated, Mexican. Um, this one I think is uh, Spanish. Three-way marinated flank steak. So there's more than one way to marinate this flank. There's three different flavor profiles. Look at it's endless as to the flank itself. And every recipe on Beef is Smoked for dinner has been triple tested on a variety of different ways, whether it's a flat surface top, a gas, um, industrial, but look at it. It's still ongoing, ongoing beef ramen, do-it-yourself beef ramen noodle jars. You know, that's awesome. Can you imagine putting this stuff together and then all you do is you put it in a jar and then you give them a cut of beef to go with it. Oh, there's a marketing idea. All right, look at that. And every and here's the sous vide flank um, steak fajitas, and I'll tell you how to do that fancy cooking method. But look at all of these recipes. And um, here's some downloadable images. You can go ahead and put that on your website and say, hey, come to the farmer's market, flank steak for sale, or if it's chuck, or if it's eye round, or whatever, you can download that image and put it on and say, come and get it. It's free for you. It's your chuck off dollars at work. So for instance, if you wanted to go back and you wanted to use a, uh, the kebabs, you can download this image. You can put sale, you know, today only, and then, have information about those kebabs and all the ways you can use that stew meat for a kebab. But again, tons more right there. And Jeannie may have already said it, what meat for kebab? What do you guys recommend? You can use, Peter, you can use almost anything. So right here, um, sometimes the kebab comes from the chuck. Yep. It can come from the round. You can even use sirloin. It depends that on it. I've used the sirloin. I've used um, the top round. If you're going to use anything from the round, you've got to tell your folks to go ahead and marinate it first. Um, even from the chuck, it's going to be marinated. But if you're going to use it from the sirloin, it's cut up and, and put it on. Um, yeah. 
some people want it already pre-cut because people have a hard time touching meat. Um, and uh, so you might want to create that for that farmer's market experience. It's already cut up for you. All you have to do is marinate it. Um, if you, and I don't know if your custom honey probably won't be able to do it because a lot of times you guys get it cut and it's frozen directly. So, um, you know, most definitely, even if you get like a, a super cool deal on maybe um, dressing packets or, or what have you, you know, you go to, to Costco or you go to these restaurant supply places and get those individual dressing packs that, you know, feed a family of four. And you put the dressing pack with your kebabs. You put the dressing pack with, you know, a top and roast and say, here, here's a free dressing pack to marinate your, your steak in or to marinate your kebabs or your stir fry, et cetera. Because even if you were to use the round, you can still cut it, you know, relatively thin and marinate it and be a great eating experience um, as a stir yes. fry. I think we use the rounds, but I think that marinate's really key to tell people. Yeah. Most definitely. So in it, and if you go into like the cuts again and you put in, let's say top round. Here's that top round steak and all of that, the other cuts that come from it. Here's that profile and you can see just the number of different ways. So here it is, it's a kebab. And here is grilled nice and thin. in all these different ways as well. Um, the saute, so they cut it thin and they skewered it and it was marinated and they were able to make like, it's almost an appetizer, the saute. Salads. So all the key is, is a nice thin cut and medium rare cookery. And here's with like the, the um, beef noodle bowls and stuff. And it's all right there. Any additional questions? So thick and versatile, typically broiled or slow cooked to bring out its best. There it is. And it kind of gives you a little butcher's note. Sometimes there's um, tips. You can actually share that cut right to your Facebook page or Twitter or Pinterest. Can copy the link and send it to you so you can use it later while you're doing stuff. Everything is printable um, or, you know, and then email it to. So maybe one of your customers says, oh my gosh, I need some top round cuts. You can go ahead and email this to them and look at all the recipes. And then of course, there's like that nutrition piece. So um, we'll probably talk a little bit more about that on the next one as far as how to set up your farmer's market table and how to kind of put it out there. Um, the nutrition piece will be a key to be able to talk about it and, and those talking points and having it at your fingertips. But when you have a chance, you know, go to Beef is What's for Dinner. Um, all of our uh, recipe links on um, nybeef.org will go to beef is what's for dinner we do have some unique things on our website um on our website itself um you know gene while you're right there um i'm sure that this will be something that'll come up in our webinar next month but um one of the tools if you go to our website is a listing um similar to the meat suite that cornell cooperative extension runs but this program is run through the northeast beef promotion and so you can go ahead and create a free profile for yourself if your farm is marketing beef directly to consumers um you can go and it's right on our home page if you go to nybeef.org and i'll show you that in a minute this is another great aspect, a marketing tool that you can use for your customers, whether it's that shredded chuck piece, using ground beef, meatloaf, or meatballs. Um, the uh, Beef is What's for Dinner created a beef plus equals, I call it beef math, where you take this shredded beef and then there's four different ways in which you can put different flavors to it. 
So if you want a barbecue sandwich, all you need is sauce, coleslaw, pickles, and a sauce bun. Voila. Uh, Asian noodle bowl. All you need are udon noodles, some vegetables, stir fry sauce, and mix it all together. Cuban beef or enchiladas. So here are four different flavor profiles just using shredded beef and whatever you might have in your pantry. So this is something that is really useful and we definitely put it out um, during COVID in the beginning. So people had extras and not knowing what to do with it and trying to utilize what they, they were doing with itself. Right down here are some rubs that we have. All five of these rubs were developed by the New York Beef Council. None of them have salt. So if those that are watching their salt intake, these are awesome. Here's a chili. This one is worth, uh, mixed with coffee. Um, it is quite tasty. This one is can be mixed with uh, that Italian flavor, meatballs, you name it. Um, this is like a breakfast sausage spice mix without the salt. A lot of times breakfast sausage can be a little salty. And this one right here, the cutting edge um, beef rub, it has some chipotle flavoring. Let me tell you, that spice mix tastes exactly like a famous restaurant that one of the spices is named after that I cannot think. But let me tell you, on beef, super good, and it's a rub. If you wanted to put it with an olive oil, and you can, it becomes an awesome marinade at the same time. So all of these can be a dry rub, or you add some oils to it, you got a marinade right there, super easy, no salt, and salt can be added a little bit later for those that might have um, salt um, issues. Um, and as Catherine mentioned, looking for local beef, Find your farms near you. This is what um, goes to the Northeast Beef Directory where you can go ahead and create that. Correct, Catherine? Sorry, I forgot I was muted. I think if you go back up to the top um, and go to the Northeast Beef Directory, that's where in the black, that's where um, there's do you sell beef or do you raise beef? And that's where you can go ahead and fill out a application to be added and listed on that directory. So it's right there, you can learn more. And some great marketing resources too, to kind of give you more insight and talking points that are consistent with what we say to our consumers because the last thing we want to do is confuse anybody. Um, so here it all is. Oh, look at us. All right, we've got a few minutes left. Anything, um, again, feel free to contact us uh, at the Beef Council. 